Hey, hi everyone. So uh, this is the mechanism design for social good um, tutorial provision and targeting for vulnerable population. Um, this is session 2A on behavioral perspectives. Um, so I'm going to talk about behavioral perspectives and then at 12, Sam is going to talk about um, computer science perspective. So let me just launch right in. Okay, so yesterday we talked about a game theoretic view of uh, poverty about targeting specifically. So we started with high and low ability people and then if the welfare benefit structure is not incentive compatible, you'll have the high types pretending to be low types. And so you'll get welfare fraud or waste. So then what, uh, the, what, what people do is then they increase the screening rigor and that will be result in better targeting and less poverty. So that process has a trade-off between adding complexity and or ordeals in order to reduce type two errors or award errors. And then you're basically getting the ineligible individuals that are getting benefits, you're reducing that. But at the cost of type 1A error, which is incomplete take up. So eligible individuals are not applying for the benefits because they anticipate high complexity and high ordeals. Okay. So this problem is um, of, of um, the poor not getting benefits is widespread. So here's an example from yesterday that you guys saw from um, the, uh, the, the Americas, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico. And in United States, the temporary assistance for needy family only reached half of those who's eligible. Um, here's one example. So ten of the, the temporary assistance for needy family was reaching 68% of um, uh, family under poverty um, in around the late 90s. And then at this point is only reaching about 22%. Um, and so the problem is not too many people getting benefits, but too few people who need benefits are getting them. So 15% of uh, people who are eligible to, for a SNAP, the foot stems are not applying for it. 25% of people who are eligible for EITC are not applying for it. Okay. So the question, um, so this kind of frames what we want to talk about in a behavioral perspective. So the first one is sort of demand side. Why is demand so low? Why are eligible people not applying for benefits? So we're going to talk about um, the complexity um, of these forms and the process and the cognitive demands of poverty. Does poverty um, affect uh, people's cognitive functioning? And then um, whether or not people re um, have higher present bias, meaning they discount their future more if they're poor and whether or not they're aware of their needs. So all of these things are things that could affect take up. The second question is like on the supply side. So why are we upset at type two errors? And this goes into um, our perspective about who deserves to be helped, right? And so wanting to separate people out from those who's unlucky versus those who's lazy and, that, that, and how this affects um, how we present our uh, benefits. Okay, so I'm gonna go into a couple of different experiments throughout this talk um, to, to illustrate these points. So um, first, let's talk about the an NIATC experiment. So this is an experiment where um, low income tax filer can get money back, okay? So this is sent to 35, forms are sent to 35,000 tax filers in California who didn't claim EITC despite being eligible. So this is 26 million unclaimed benefits. So this tax filer gets a couple version of forms. So one of it is a simple form that you see on the left side. So there you see like two checkboxes, step one, and then you get to step two immediately. And then a more complex form that has like all those different checkboxes that you see over there. And this is just one page out of two. Um, there's many other versions that they send out. So some of the play with the idea that poor people are not filing due to stigma. So they have like a stigma reducer um, uh, treatment, which is they say, you have earned a refund due to your many hours of employment. Um, there's also, filings that uh, there's also forms that basically emphasize benefits. So telling them how much benefit they could get up front. Yesterday on our exercise session, we had people look for benefits of different forms and it was, it was not simple. So this one had the benefits placed up front. And, but what we're interested in is basically the simplicity versus complexity, right? So you can see here, 
the, the complex form reduces, um, reduces take up by a significant amount. And the question is, um, and so you can basically give up about like five, uh, like a, a substantial amount of money if you had um, by using a simpler form. So the question is why is complexity in applications so costly for the poor? Okay, so one possibility is complexity is costly for the poor because poverty impedes cognitive function. There's a couple, it's, this is still an open question. There's a couple of paper that says, yes, it does impede cognitive function. And there's papers that says no. Um, so let's look at the yes. So in this one, it's not just poverty impedes cognitive function. It's just the mere thought of poverty, the stress that comes when you are thinking about what it's like to be poor impedes cognitive function. So in this paper by Mani in Science, uh, 2013, oh, the earlier paper was Bagarfa and Manoli um, in, in AR. So this paper, um, they had two studies. So one study, you experimentally induce thoughts about finance and then you measure cognitive function. So you have people walking through a mall and um, there are rich and poor shoppers that they survey. So then they ask the shoppers to imagine car repairs. So in one case, the car repair is cheap and then the other one, it's, it's expensive. And so what they had them imagine is that your car is having some trouble. It requires the low amount or the high amount. It's randomized to be fixed. You can pay this in full, you can take a loan or you can take a chance and forego the service at the moment. So how would you go about making this decision? So they wanted them to describe how they would make this decision. While they're thinking about this, they do some cognitive tests and they get paid 25 cents per correct answer. And then when they're done with the cognitive test, then they give answer on the car repair. So this is done so that they keep this, um, uh, this process of thinking about this budget constraint in their mind. So what is the cognitive test like? So here's one example that is uh, the Raven's matrix. Um, so you have to find a pattern that fits this, uh, this the sequence of patterns. And this is a common component of IQ tests and it's, it measures um, fluid um, intelligence, which is your ability to solve problems in um, situations that you haven't seen before. So they had a Raven's test type of uh, test. And then another one is a cognitive control test. So here you, um, here you, can, you have to state the colors as fast as you can. So for this one, um, if I go on row one, it's red, blue, green, yellow, right? And then in the one with, on the cognitive control task, now I have to stay again, state the color as fast as I can. So it's like um, green, yellow, red, blue. So this is harder because now there's an incongruent stimuli. The color and the letters are different. So this is called a Stroop test, and it is one example of a cognitive control test. So basically, it measures your speed of processing when there is a, when you need to control uh, your cognitive inputs. Okay, all right. So what did they find? So what they found was if it was an easy test, like uh, the easy budget problem, which is $150, which both the poor and the rich was able to afford, then there was no difference in the cognitive test. However, when it's the $1,500 car repairs, which is much more difficult for the poor to afford, there's a big difference in how they perform in the Raven matrix and in the cognitive control. So they, they read this as um, effect of thinking about financial stress on your cognitive processing. So it's like sort of an overload, okay? Um, and they test this as well with um, farmers in India. Um, so these are farmers who made most of their money from a sugar cane and they surveyed them before and after harvest. So first they set out to see that, this, uh, that the farmers were indeed resource constrained before harvest. So here you can see that before uh, the harvest reduced the likelihood that they had to pawn belongings, harvest reduced the likelihood that they have loans outstanding. So it really did um, eliminate financial stress, okay? So now they're going to compare the cognitive test uh, before and after harvest. So after post-harvest payment, they do their harvest, they sell it and then they get their payment. Um, the Raven's accuracy test went up and the Stroop time for the Stroop test for the cognitive control test went down. So basically cognitive control improved. Um, 
and this is equivalent to like a couple you know points in the IQ so it was a it was a significant improvement and they test that this is not due to learning so some of you might say hey they did this test before and after harvest so they have to do they get to do it twice so maybe they learned so what they did is they held apart uh, 100 farmers who only took the test once after harvest right so they were able to compare that and they could tell that it wasn't due to learning okay but this is this the effect of cognitive control the effect of poverty on cognitive control is not found in all studies so there are studies like Carval Howell uh, Meyer and Wang a or 2016 that did not find a difference so here they took uh, 3,800 people and they split them up so these are people with low income and they split them up to half that they survey before payday and half that they survey after payday. And they see that um, if you look at the difference in before and after, before payday, they were using, their expenditure was much lower than after payday, which means that they were uh, financially constrained by payday, okay? So after payday, they were able to spend uh, more and uh, presumably release a lot, uh, reduce a lot of stress but their working memory and the strip time test did not show any difference here. Okay, so this is still open, uh, uh, research is still being done here. Okay. So we talked about um, complexity and how complexity might have a, a larger effect on people who are poor because poverty might have an effect on cognitive demands, right? So you see the same pile of forms that you see when you are not stressed by finances and when you're stressed by finances you just think like oh I, I really can't do this or you make mistakes or um, it takes you much longer than you, it does normally okay all right so that's um, cognitive demand another thing could be present bias so what is present bias so present bias is um, how we think about the current period versus the future so if I have a consumption X is zero at the current period and X1 to XT in the future, my consumption in the future is discounted by delta, which is the normal discount rate. And this delta is, um, is constant. But then there's an extra component there, beta, which is how I think about the future. And beta is something that is less than one if I am present bias, which means that anything that is not now is discounted more, right? I, I, I value it less. So if the poor are applying for, um, for benefits, they have to take up costly action now, and then they're going to get their benefits in the future. So the take up rate, if this was the case and they were more discounted in the future, uh, they, they, were more, they had a higher discount rate, they would be taking up benefits at a lower rate than the, the non-poor because their beta is lower. And so there is some evidence that has shown that there is a correlation between lower beta being more present bias than, and um, income. So there's a study by um, Tanaka et al. and AAR, the, uh, 2010, um, of families in Vietnam. And then there's also a 76 country study by uh, Domin et al. QJE that shows the correlation between impatience and poverty. So there's open questions here, right? So one, you might ask, is it really impatience? Like, I don't want to wait. Or is it liquidity constraint? I cannot borrow against the future, so I have to eat now, so I can't wait. It's not that my preferences have changed, it's just simply I can't, I can't borrow from liquidity. So um, there are studies that, that, uh, that, that discusses that. So this Carvalho study showed that with time, they're not, they don't seem to be cognitively constrained. There's no difference, but with money, they do. And then there's another question of the relationship between this patience and um, cognitive, cognitive uh, constraints. So um, this study by Doman uh, shows that cognitive ability is related to impatience. And so if poverty affects your cognitive ability, it also has a channel to affect your impatience. Okay? But putting this aside, let's talk about um, how this affects take up. So if you look at, um, take up of programs such as um, commitment saving devices for, for example, 401k enrollment, um, you see a difference in income rate. So people with lower income, this is Madrin and Shea a paper in QJE on 401k. So these are people who work for a firm. So this is not like the poorest of the poor that, we, um, uh, that we've been looking at earlier. So they, they do work for a firm. And um, 
so people who whose compensation is is low um, participate in the 401k at a much lower rate than people whose compensation who has higher income right so it's like 12% uh, participate participation up to 68% and this is if you have to opt in like if you have to choose to participate but what they did was they changed it so that you are by default participating and you have to opt out and it made a huge difference so here you can opt out so if you actually cannot afford to save you can opt out get out of it but what they see is that the effect of um the effect of changing this default from opting in to opting out results in a huge increase in a take up of 401k among people with low income um, compared with people with like that is that is non poor of like higher income so it says that there is room for them to take up, like even if they want, and um, um, even if people want to and they can take up a commitment device, there is something else that is affecting them so they don't do it. And they, Madrin and Shea paper point, uh, the, points it to uh, procrastination in starting, right? Starting requires this upfront cost. If you wanna put it off for the next day, you don't do it. And so this seems to be a bigger problem among um, the low income population. Okay. So um, if, I, if I want to, if I am, if I'm not forced to take it up, then, and I know that I, then I need to know that I have a low beta and I do need to take up this, uh, this, this uh, programs. So um, we did a study. Um, so this is um, Elif and Sakara Hafaler and me. Uh, uh, we did this in Journal of Economic Psychology. So we did a study at a transitional shelter for the working homeless. So here, um, the, the clients of this shelter have an income. They have their room and board covered. And in our study earlier, we know that they have a very low beta. And there's a very low take up rate of the shelter savings program. And they also have little or no savings outside of the shelter. So what we wanna do is we wanna know whether or not um, awareness of self-control problem affects take up here. So the way we measure awareness here is we ask people for their income and then we ask them to, per to say how much would they ideally save out of their income and how much do they predict they will save. So remember that all expenditure is covered. Okay, so we call this expected deviation. And then after that, we're gonna observe their savings at the shelter. So remember, there's very little savings outside. So our hypothesis is that <clears throat> the higher, <clears throat> the more you're aware <clears throat> that what you would actually do is less than what you would ideally do, the more you'll take up the savings program. And we think that this awareness will have a larger effect on those that has a worse self-control problem. So we saw that, uh, indeed we saw that every hundred dollars of predicted shortfall in their ability and awareness um, translates to about $9.82 of more money that is put in the shelter savings program. So they're, they, knowing that they will fall behind what is ideal for them, does encourage them to put in to use the uh, the shelter savings device more and this was especially true for those who were homeless who said that they were homeless due to addiction so they were aware that they also had a substance control issue like another self-control issue um, so this shows that you uh, those with lower beta do need more services but only those that are aware of their own beta uses the service so there is an interaction between the uh, self-control and the awareness that affects take up. Okay. So um, there's a there's a cool study here um, that uh, one question that you might have is does poverty um, cause this present bias or is it just a correlation? Um, and this paper here tries to answer that question by giving people negative income shock. So if you see on this, um, so this is a lab experiment. So people start with this level of income, they're rich, or this level of income, they're poor. And then they go about, they earn more money, earn more money, and at this point they get a shock, and then they become poor. And so at this level, their income level is the same, they're poor. So what they're going to compare is people who have experienced a negative shock 
versus those that were always poor. And then they had a parallel, which is people who are always rich versus people who had a positive shock and became rich. So if poverty is caused by, um, if present bias is caused by poverty, you will see an effect on um, either always poor or people who are shocked to be poor. But if, if present bias is caused by a negative income shock, then you will see the effect only among uh, these guys here, the ones that started out rich and then had a negative shock and then became poor. And that is indeed what we see. Okay, so the yellow line here is comparing those who, who have the same level of income, they're poor, but those that experience a negative shock versus those that do not experience, that was just always poor. Okay, so um, there are some evidence that sh negative shocks affects present bias, causing people to uh, discount the future for the present. Okay, so summarizing, um, the behavioral view of targeting the poor is, is like this. So you start out um, in a difficult living environment where there's a lot of scarcity, right? So you're constantly thinking about your budget constraints, your resource constraints, you're stressed, and then you also experience more negative shocks. All of this stress causes cognitive dysfunction, um, your working memory suffers, your cognitive control suffers, your fluent intelligence suffers, and that um, affects present bias or your present bias is also affected by the negative shocks, right? So anyway, um, the third box here, things, things, kind of, things drop, right? Okay, so then you have low take up of programs that help because you have to pay upfront cost. So in that case, if you increase screening rigor, you will have worse take up. You will have worse targeting and then you'll have more poverty. Okay, so the, so here, what you wanna do is you wanna give uh, the, the benefits to those that are having problems um, even applying for it. Okay, so this is what, in, with, in this model, increasing screening rigor does not have a good effect. Okay, so that was definitely a different model than the game theory model that we saw earlier. So let's return to that game theory model where we're trying to separate out. Basically, we're screening out um, high types that are pretending to be low types, right? We're screening, we're taking out type two errors. So um, why is type two errors very upsetting for a policymaker and for taxpayers? So let's talk a little bit uh, about deservingness. So when do we help the poor? Willingness to help the poor depends on how we see poverty. Basically, the question of why are people poor basically ends up with lazy or unlucky. And people prefer to assist the unlucky. There's lots of studies on this. So you, uh, you, you frame someone who needs help as sick or as drunk. Nobody wants to help the drunk, they want to help the sick. You frame something as people having an accident because they're out partying or because they're not out partying. They don't want to help those that are out partying. You frame a situation as someone who's disabled or they had, uh, they're poor because they're disabled or they had used drugs. Again, um, the disabled gets more sympathy. And variations in this belief can explain the differences in uh, redistributive policy uh, across many countries. So there's a whole bunch of papers from Piketty, Alessina, um, uh, on like country, cross country comparisons of redistributive policy connected to their beliefs of whether people are lazy or unlucky. Okay. And this ties directly into targeting. So framing the poor as lazy leads to support for stricter requirements for benefits and welfare. So in this study by Peterson in AJPS 2012, you have a Danish undergrad that are presented with vignettes. So it basically goes, imagine a man who receives social welfare benefits, and then they like tell stories about this guy, okay? So the story can either say that this man is fit, he's able-bodied, he's fit, or he has a work-related injury. And so if you're fit, that's uh, the lazy um, manipulation and work-related injury is the unlucky manipulation. So you can see here that support for stricter requirements um, goes up when you, uh, it's, it's possibly correlated with um, people who are in the lazy manipulation 
And when you think that the recipient is unlucky, then you have let, then you support strict requirements less. And this is driven by emotion, right? So we've talked about like game theoretically targeting and screening all this stuff, but like emotions is a big part of this. So when you frame the recipient as lazy, people feel anger. And when you frame the recipient as, as um, unlucky, people feel compassion. So where do people get this framing, right? I mean, we don't go around and just like label people as unlucky or lazy. So this is affected by many, many things, including how governments frame policies. Um, so taking something that is happening um, in less developing countries in LDC, um, this is our study from um, CPS. Um, and so this is me and Nita Rudra at Georgetown. So this is a political science uh, uh, paper that looked at the effect of foreign direct investment. Okay, so a lot of LDC government will um, increase support for FDI by talking about poverty. So here, there's no country that has fought poverty without attracting FDI. In India, the Financial Express says more FDI is needed to generate employment and cut poverty. Okay. So FDI is connected to poverty alleviation. So what we do is we, so this is what we want to test. Does bringing, does the idea that FDI is here make people think that the poor are lazy because otherwise they would have made use of this poverty alleviation program. So we did a field experiment in malls and cafeterias in India. So we just, you know, we just uh, talked to, we, we ask people if they want to take a survey, they get some um, money, and then after that, we provide vignettes of the poor that are living in slums, um, and that these are, real, uh, these are real recipients, and then they can decide on how much to donate to them. After people have decided how much to donate, we give them more information about the economic environment that is near the poor, and then they can revise their donation. So the information about the economic environment is about the local factory. So uh, people are randomized into four groups. So one says there is a low skill factory near this recipient. So this is a food and beverage manufacturing. And then the other one, it's a high skill factory. Okay, so it's an IT manufacturing firm. In the, in, in, in the other two treatments, we say the same thing, except that we say it is US owned. So we say we, it's owned by a foreign company, right? It's owned by a non-Indian company. Uh, uh, OECD country. Okay, so what we expect to see is that because low skill FDI was so, um, so marketed as part of poverty alleviation, we're going to see an effect when we see that the poor lives near FDI low skill factory. And indeed we see that. So this is the, the likelihood that um, the donor reduced their donation after, after um, we give them extra information about the economic circumstances. So people are 23% more likely to reduce their donation when they learn that there's a low skill foreign owned factory near the poor. And this effect is driven by those who believe that FDA is good for the poor, right? So it's directly, they believe the FDA is good for the poor, FDA is here, so the poor should be better off. If you're still poor, I'm not gonna help you. Okay, and this, um, even in cases of uncertainty, we also have a bias toward interpreting that the poor is uh, negative, negative information, negative um, signals about the poor. So here's a study by Fang and Abu Horsidi at uh, Journal of Public Economics 2011. So here people are giving to low income public housing residents. And in that, in that uh, public housing, there's 50% disabled and there's 50% drug user, right? So among the, the pool of recipient that they have. So people don't know whether the recipient is disabled or drug user. So they don't know if they're lazy or unlucky per se. They have two treatments. So one is the no choice treatment. So in the no choice treatment, people are either told why the recipient is poor or they're not. So if you are told, not told that the recipient is poor, you give about $3. If you're told that they're poor because of the disability, you give $4. If, you give, if you're told that they're poor because of drug use, it's $2.50. Okay, so now we go into a choice treatment. In the choice treatment, you can spend a dollar to learn 
about the poor. Okay, you can learn, you can buy it with a dollar, you can learn whether your recipient is poor, uh, is disabled or had used drugs. So one third of participants bought this information and that's the choice treatment. So I'm gonna show you the choice treatment in the red. So those that does not buy the information reduces their giving. It becomes about uh, $2 instead of three. Those that bought information and learned that the poor is disabled doesn't really increase their giving. But those that learn that the poor use drugs dramatically decrease their driven, right? So this information, even when people are uncertain and they seek information, this information affects, um, affects people's willingness to give more negatively rather than positively. It is the negative signals that moves behavior. So overall, there is a moral thing that enters into this game theoretic uh, framework that we will put up earlier, right? So the high ability pretending to be low, that is lazy, that is like, that is undeserving. And so you get, uh, if you increase screening rigor, you will reach the unlucky more. And that is sort of like the, um, and then you will get be uh, better targeting and basically like you are, you're taking out the bad types and then you're helping the good types. So overall, we can have, uh, you can have very different policy prescriptions about how to target the poor, depending on whether you see it as a, the game theoretic way of screening out the lazy from the unlucky or the scarcity model, the behavioral model of poverty causing cognitive dysfunction and present biases that then makes it hard for the poor to take a program. Okay, so that is all. Thank you.